Good evening, everyone. Tonight, I want to show you a couple of ideas about the Chopin Bear Sus, Opus 57. I never really learned the piece to perform it, but I learned the notes of it, and it's extremely difficult. It's a, it's a concert work. It's meant for great artists, really, uh, unless you persevere and do all the hard work on every facet of the piece, because the weaknesses show up right away if you don't. Uh, it's, it's a cradle song, so it has to have the element of being relaxed, and it's written in compound time, 6-8 time, which means it's like 3-4 time twice in each bar, and the second 3-4 can be thought of like an echo of the first 3-4. And so that's what gives it that gentle rocking from side to side or cradle, putting the baby to sleep. And so you can't take it as a virtuoso piece and play it as fast as you can go. It just doesn't work right. But uh, it's this piece here. I'll show you a little bit of it. And the other thing is <laughs> that the pedal has to be changed at the, f at the first for the... F the pedal's down for the first half of the bar, the first three eighths. Then you have to have a clean release and then play it down again and then clean off uh, for the second th group of three eighths. So one, and, and have the shoulders so relaxed that the upper arm can roll forward when you flop and swing down in in the wrist and flop right through. And that way, when the wrist comes up, the finger can brush the key as gently as you want as it lifts the hammer as slowly as you want to go as quiet as you want up into the, into the wire. And it can lift it as gently by just, if you're playing really soft, just play to the point of the escapement. You feel that right there, that bump, and then that fret. When you play just there, you don't get it as heavy, and so you can get a much more ethereal, quiet, Re reflective sound and I remember Douglas voice telling me that once at, at Ottawa U he said depress the key halfway as it were and I didn't understand what he was talking about at that point but now I see what he was getting at if you only play the key halfway down and then brush it you'll lop the hammer up very gently and you'll get that quiet effect so Feeling the rocking is very important before you even start to play. And so when you can have the shoulders so relaxed that the upper arm can roll forward and the wrist can swing down and then can the finger can brush the key as it draws the wrist up and you have the doorknob rotation as well, then everything sort of comes together to make it a fluid feeling because it can't sound jerky. It's a cradle song. It's got a have that easy rocking feel to it. So one, two. I need, I need, I need that thumb, so one. have a big enough hand for that. Hopefully if I practice it my hand will get bigger and because it's a ten, it's a ninth there. Here it's a it's a ninth again. So when it goes see it's C and D flat together. Now B flat and C so you could roll it if you can't reach it. The only 
thing in this part here is you have to realize that one eighth is four thirty seconds and it's on for one and then going to another note for two, three, and four. So one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four. So the melody, even though the A flat plays every time, it's that's voicing. And so the finger that's going to be brought out has to be as steel as you can make it, stretch it, poke it, whatever you have to do to have it steel, so that when you have this rolling forward, you can brush it and just bring out that note so that you hear. flat major going D E F G only it starts on a G natural so it's D flat major only a G natural just at that spark now it's the G flat now it moves chromatically doing that you've got to keep this gentle rocking going on. So one, two, three, four. There's a long decrescendo over two bars there. So then you've got an accent on that. They're bigger on that and then top of a decrescendo so this is what's hard here is that this one eight is one like that that's four thirty seconds one two three four one two three four one two three four one two three four, one, two, three, four five six so it's it's a triplet on an eighth so so here it's Instead of four thirty seconds, like one two three four, one two three four, one two three four. Now it's it's three in the time of of the four, so it's slower. Now we're up to our sixth eight. So that on that sixth eight, you gotta have a six uh, double thirds. One two three four five six. So it's gotta be played twice as fast as as if it was just a triplet. So the triplet is so four, five, now six, one, like that. So one, two. I gotta have firmer fingers. Here you've got to make the difference between on each eighth having two sixteenths, like one, two, one, two, one, two, one, one, two. Now it's a triplet. One, two, three, one, two, three, one, two. So one, two. So it's got to be one, two, three. Those are really tricky. You have to understand what you're playing. It's it's chromatic. So if you play the top. Right to there and then. It's a whole tone. So underneath it's chromatic. But 
bit on the next page, but this, there, this page is really difficult, this second page, in so many ways, like when it starts the B section. You have to realize that on every eighth, the thumb is playing part of C major scale going down from dominant to dominant. So G. So. When you're aware of that, it makes it a lot simpler. And when you're aware of the top note, that's the third out of four thirty seconds for every group, it's D flat major. skips the D flat and goes to C. So, and every second note of the group of four, it's a semitone up from the first, from the thumb. So thumb. So when you can do that for memory, because you just know that it's C major, dominant to dominant, and between every note and that of that thumb, you play one semitone higher. Makes it a lot simpler when you know that the top note is D flat major descending. Only you leave out that D flat, so. That part is really tricky, so, so you just write in the fingering. One, two, one, three, two, because it's, it's, it's chromatic. Now, if you play every second note, you see the chromatic scale in there. So one, two, one, three, two, four, one, three, one, three, two, four, one three two four one three two one three one three two four one three it's really quite pretty now six of them are slower but these are quicker now this is the last line so this is just chromatic so what I use is one three two four one three two four one five two three four so I'm just sliding my second finger from the black key B flat up to the B natural second finger and I've got a four two on that three one Two four, now one five, two three, two four, one three, two four, three one, four two, three one, three two, four two, three one, two four, uh, five one, that's D and F. Now two four, one three. Two five, one three two five, one three two five one three one three two five. They're all the same. Anyway, then it goes into the next part, <coughs> where it uh, where it comes. So on. <laughs> now the last <coughs> two pages of the piece are really, really beautiful. Well, the whole piece is beautiful, but <laughs> as you put your D crescendo, play less deeply. Now you're into dolce. Sostenuto, so you have to have that singing tone, so then your echo.
bass has to be heard a little bit. The soprano has to be less than the E flat. So I hope that gives you some ideas, uh, Sandra, and anyone else who's trying this piece uh, in your attempt to practice it properly and save time because you can waste a lot of time just playing the notes over with a different fingering every time and so on and it, it's very counterproductive. But when you write in the fingering that works best for your hand and it's consistent, you, get, you start to get a muscle memory for it and it, it comes along quite nicely. Anyway, good luck with your practicing. Hope you enjoy it. Bye-bye.